Hey everyone, Harris O'Malley from TalkToNerdLove.com. This week, we are going to do things a little different. I am bringing on a guest, my good friend Arden Lee, who is the creator and facilitator of the Repatterning Project, to talk a little bit about how to fix or improve your life, how to recognize patterns in your life that are making it harder for you to achieve your goals, whether your goals are to have better, stronger, more meaningful relationships, to get out of your own way when it comes to your own success in terms of work, business, developing your social skills, building the life that you've always wanted. Sometimes it is very easy to fall into negative patterns that end up sabotaging our own progress. The hard part is not just recognizing them, but understanding how to break out of those patterns and build new ones. And so, without further ado, one of the smartest, most insightful women I have known over these years, Arden Lee. Take it away. Hello, hello, everyone. My name is Arden Lee, and I am so excited to be a guest speaker on Harris's channel today. Harris and I have been friends for several years, and I was so honored when he reached out to me to ask me to do a guest video for his channel about a topic that I happen to be pretty familiar with, and that is recognizing some of our patterns and knowing how to discern for which ones are working for us and which ones we've adopted in the past that might be unconscious strategies to meet very legitimate underlying needs, but which aren't actually serving us in ways that are effective at meeting those needs. So a little bit about me, I am the creator of a course called The Repatterning Project, no surprise, because this is my jam, and I'm really excited to talk about this today. So I'm gonna start off by talking about what our patterns are, how they form, a little bit about our human operating system and how that works so that we can better understand our human computer so that we can then become our own programmers so that we can operate in more effective ways in our day-to-day -day lives and also in our long-term goals. Then I'm gonna talk a little bit about how to recognize our patterns. Where do we bring in that mindfulness? How do we recognize what we're doing when something is working for us and when it's not working for us? And then finally, I'm gonna talk about what we can do in order to change those, in order to take our power back and have control over the things that we're doing in our lives so that we can actually meet those goals, those needs, and those dreams that we wanna meet with effective strategies, effective ways of being, rather than the ones that got set during earlier times in our neuroplastic development when maybe we weren't quite as discerning as we are able to be now. So that's what we're gonna cover today. I'm excited for that. It's a lot, <laughs> but I'm confident that we can get through it in this video and that I can somehow help you to equip you with better tools to be able to do this kind of work on your own. So let's get started with that said. All right, so the first thing I wanna talk about is what is a pattern and how does it form? What are we even talking about when we talk about this work? Well, let's start at the very beginning with when people are born. <laughs> when we are born and when we come into the world, we all have strategies that we equip ourselves with in order to get our needs met. And over the years, as we live our lives, the feedback that we receive from utilizing those strategies are essentially things that either set those patterns within us or discourage us from them. And this is particularly true in our most neurodevelopmentally years. Um, I would say it's probably even truest <laughs> between zero and four. And then we tend to have that sort of neuroplasticity. As scientists say, we have it up until about, you know, maybe between the age of 20 and 25. Now, I personally have a theory that the reason that our brains tend to have less plasticity, that is less ongoing learning ability after the age of 25, I actually believe that it has less to do with our biology, with our neurology, and more to do with our social conditioning. Because it's at that point, around between 2025, that we graduate college, 
We tend to take our first jobs in the fields that we want to go into and we tend to stop learning and be comfortable. Now, for those of us who can retain open-mindedness and continue learning and retain that growth mindset that allows us to continue receiving and implementing feedback in as close to real time as possible, well, those people are the ones who are going to keep on growing and learning and evolving and we're all capable of doing that. So I put that out there to say that technically the textbook definition says our neuroplasticity, that is our ability to learn new patterns, goes up until about, like I said, between 20 and 25. But I personally don't like to limit us to that. I believe that we are capable of learning and growing and evolving and assessing those patterns and making those changes basically until the end of our lives for about as long as we're on the earth and we have the willpower and the desire to do so and to put our action behind it. So when we are babies, let's go back to that example. When we're babies, we have needs that we need to be able to communicate to our major caregivers who are usually, in most cases, our parents. So the best example I can give, the most simple example, is if a baby needs to be fed, it's probably going to cry. Its voice is the only tool for communication that it has at that point in its stage of development to use to alert its caregivers to the fact that there is something that it needs. So it cries and then it learns whether that crying was effective or not based on the reaction it gets. So if a baby cries and then its mother or caregiver comes to it and holds it and comforts it and gives it food or holds it and, and you know, gives them everything that they need, then that baby is going to learn, oh hey, crying works, so it's okay for me to use my voice to ask to get my needs met. Now, if you have a different baby who comes into the world in a different environment with parents who are neglectful, that baby might learn, hey, I cried and nobody came to my rescue, so I learned that it's more effective for me to just save my voice and concentrate on getting my needs met somehow myself. And this is how you end up with adults who grew up who end up wanting to do everything on their own and feel, you know, like it's there's no point in asking for help of the people who are around them. Now, you might also have a baby who grows up in a household that is not only neglectful, but also abusive. You might have a baby who comes into the world and cries because it needs to be fed. And instead of having that, that baby's needs met, and instead of having it just neglected, which is bad enough, you might have a situation where that baby experiences abuse, being yelled at, being physically hit, being disciplined, quote unquote, in negative ways, in traumatic ways, that basically tell that baby that it is not safe to use its voice and cry in order to ask to have its needs met. So therefore, you might have someone who grows up into being an adult who's like, not only is there no point in me using my voice to ask to have my needs met, but there is danger. I learned, quote unquote, at a young age that there is danger in me speaking up and using my voice and disrupting those around me to let them know that I have a need. Is any of this sounding, sounding kind of familiar so far, right? <laughs> but of course, we can't control the circumstances that we came into, that we were born into as babies. So it's up to us as adults to recognize these patterns and determine whether they're healthy for us, whether, and by healthy I mean, are they effective? Are they actually meeting the need that we believe that they're meeting? If we grow up and we are always afraid to use our voice to ask for our needs to be met, we're probably going to not end up in relationships that are terribly healthy, or even if we do manage to attract a partner who is healthy for us and wants to meet our needs, we're gonna have a hard time voicing those needs to that partner because somewhere on the inside, we still remember what it was like when that pattern formed and when that belief formed that said, it is unsafe for me to speak up and voice my needs. So the work that I do and the work that I teach focuses on giving people the, the power to take back that initial time when that pattern was set 
and to change it into something that is more effective. So this is pretty deep work. <laughs> and like I said, it's a lot to cover in one video, but hopefully what I can do is I can give you an overview to see how this can be possible and to see how uh, you might be able to redo and reinstall some of the patterns that are in your own life with some of the tools that I'm gonna talk about in this video, right? So essentially, what I think of as patterns, right, are things that we do over and over again as strategies that we believe somehow in our unconscious minds, in our unconscious mind-body systems are going to be effective to get us the results we want. I'm going to talk about another couple examples of patterns that are, let's call them ineffective strategies to meet what are really very real, valid, and legitimate underlying needs. So I'll give a first example of that one. Not too long ago, I had a guy slide into my DMs on Instagram and make a comment about my body. <laughs> now, I'm a very online woman, <laughs> and I get a lot of messages like these all the time. And in this particular instance, this man and I actually had some friends in common, and I kind of knew him through some social scenes. So I agreed to actually meet up with him, but I was pretty straightforward when I hung out with him, and I said, you know... I have a feeling that when you sent that message, that there was an underlying need that is very real and very legitimate that you were wanting to meet. You were wanting connection. You were wanting to open a conversation for a possibility of maybe intimacy or perhaps even just friendship and that you have an overwhelming need for, for the kind of connection that is going to allow you to eventually facilitate the kind of interactions that you're going to need in order to create a fulfilling partnership in your life. Am I right about that? And the guy was like, yeah, how'd you know? And I was like, well, this is kind of what I do. Let me tell you, sliding into my DMs on Instagram and making a comment about my body is not the way to go about having that need get met. Now, that's a very legitimate need, as I said, but somewhere along the line, you maybe had the idea that sliding into my DMs and making this comment that absolutely does nothing for me, except quite frankly, kind of bother me and not give me a terribly great opinion of you. Now, you're lucky that we had friends in common <laughs> and that I know that there is someone underneath that behavior who is... Um, uh, who's not represented and reflected in totality by that one Instagram DM slide. So I'm here to have a conversation with you about it, right? So that happened. <laughs> and that's one way that we can try and meet a need with something that's not very effective, right? If you're going to go into the DMs of a woman online who uh, has never met you before, and uh, especially one who puts herself out there like I do, I told this dude, I was like, man, I get comments like this all the time. I am not interested in hearing that someone is interested in my body, right? There's so many other cool things that I do. I make music, I run this amazing course, right? We have friends in common. There's so many other things that you could have said to open up that connection that is going to give you the opportunity, or at the very least, the best chances as possible to achieve that connection and intimacy, emotional intimacy, perhaps even leading to physical intimacy and connection and partnership that I know that you're looking for. So there's one example of something that is an effective, an ineffective strategy to get an underlying need met that is still real and legitimate. Let's talk about another way that a pattern can potentially form. Alcoholism. I tend to define any kind of addiction as a pattern that has been overlearned beyond its usefulness. And this is uh, something that I picked up. I want to just give credit where credit is due. I picked this up from the research of Maya Salovitz, who is the author of Unbroken Brain, A Revolutionary New Way of Understanding Addiction, and also from Bessel van der Kolk, author of The Body Keeps the Score, and also from Vince Felitti, who is a researcher whose studies were uh, cited in The Body Keeps the Score by Bessel van der Kolk. So essentially, if we think of addiction as a pattern that has been overlearned beyond its usefulness, what that means is that we do something for the first time and it seems to work for us. And so we do it again and we do it again and we do it again. And at some point, we reach a point where perhaps we don't even realize that the overall cumulative effects of running this pattern has actually caused a lot of havoc and destruction in our lives. So alcoholism is a great example of that. Let's say that you have a person who is out at a bar 
and decides to take a shot in order to get some liquid courage to go and approach that attractive person at the other end of the bar that they want to be able to have a conversation with. And let's say in this instance that in that time it works. They take that shot, they feel more confident about approaching someone and being friendly with them. And for that first time, maybe, yeah, they're like, this is great. And their unconscious learns, hey, alcohol is a great idea. <laughs> if I wanna have confidence and I wanna be able to go talk to people, and what happens over time? After a while, it's not just one shot anymore. After a while, you need two, and then three, et cetera, et cetera. And then soon, you go down that pattern where the cumulative effects of this behavior over time is actually causing more harm in your life than good, right? It's causing more problems. You're maybe missing work, right? You're hung over all the time. You're destroying your liver, right? All because you tried something in the beginning and it worked once in that moderate dose, right? Or at the very least, you thought that it worked. Could be that that person at the end of the bar would have liked you just as much anyway without having taken that shot of alcohol, right? That's what we hope anyway when we're aiming for attraction with other people. But if your brain believes that it worked, then it's going to go ahead and set that pattern. What's another uh, uh, example I can give you of a pattern that's been overlearned beyond its usefulness? Well, I'll give you one that was mine. Um, I know Harris from being in the pickup community back in the day. I was a pickup artist and uh, I wrote a book called The New Rules of Attraction and I believed that my own underlying need for love and connection and relationship was going to be solved if I could just be attractive and pleasing enough. So I put all of my energy into being hot, right? Into being, into raising my sexual market value, you know? <laughs> as much as that phrase may kind of seem laughable now, at the time, I did everything in my power to be more attractive. The problem was I was putting so many eggs into that basket that I wasn't looking at other things that are necessary for a healthy relationship, like say my discernment about the people that I was choosing to be with, or my ability to speak up about my needs, considering that I had been a baby once back in the day who had grown up in a household who was punished for speaking out about her needs. So you can't have that love and connection and healthy relationship, doesn't matter how hot you are or how high your sexual market value is, if you're not choosing people who really love you for who you are and you're not equipping yourself to be able to speak up about your needs and relationship, you're probably not going to be able to achieve that healthy relationship. So. I was running with my pattern of being attractive. I was running with that so hard that I was ignoring other facets of my life. And in fact, I would say that I made so much attempt to perform for the male gaze that I was actually attracting men who were attracted me to me precisely because I was pleasing in that way. And they wanted a partner who was going to bow to their will and defer to them and not have any needs and just try and be pleasing and attractive at all times. Now, again, I can look at the society we live in and say, well, yeah, I was conditioned to believe that, right? Growing up and being conditioned as a woman in society, we absolutely receive messages all the time that say that our value or our worth correlates to how attractive we are. So I can forgive myself for learning this bad pattern the same way that I encourage all of you to forgive yourselves for learning bad patterns that I, our society conditions us into, right? And for men, these patterns can look the same, right? They might be slightly different in flavor, but for men, men are often told like, you have to be uh, attractive to, you know, you not, not only do you have to also be attractive in order to attract and keep a partner, but you also have to be a provider. Your attractiveness is also based on your ability to create wealth. It's also based on your ability to go hard at the gym. It's based on the kind of car you drive and the kind of women you date. It's based on your sexual market value. It's based on your access, right? How well is that working for you? <laughs> That's a good question, right? So these are the kind of patterns that we aim to look at and to dismantle if they're not working for us and to reinstall patterns that are going to actually get us to the places that we want to be and actually meet those very real, very legitimate underlying needs. So
now let's go ahead and talk about that. First of all, how do we recognize our patterns? Well, one would be a practice of mindfulness, right? Bringing more and more self-awareness to the strategies that we use in our lives and whether they're actually working for us or not. I could go all the way down a rabbit hole about the practice of mindfulness, but essentially what it means is just bringing more consciousness and bringing more self-awareness to every moment and every choice we make and understanding when we are responding in a way that is making a choice and knowing that we have a power over the choices we make rather than just responding reactively or unconsciously. So sometimes it means just bringing that pause into our daily lives to say, hmm, this person sent me an angry text message. Do I wanna immediately get all my feelings involved and send something super angry back? Or do I wanna take a pause and think about how I wanna respond? And do I wanna maybe even think about overall, do I wanna have friendships and relationships with people who are just sending me angry text messages out of the blue? Is this something that I really wanna keep in my life, right? <laughs> there are many layers to this. So mindfulness is one example and it's absolutely worth looking into what that practice means uh, as a whole, which is way more than I could put into this one video, but that's certainly one way to go about it. Another way to do it is something that I like to call emotional self-mastery. And for this, I specifically recommend a tool that is an app that you can download in the app store for iPhone or Android, and it is called Mood Meter. You'll recognize it because it has an X, Y axis of red, yellow, green, and blue colors on it. And essentially, you track your mood on this X, Y axis in this app by, you know, how high energy <laughs> versus low energy and negative and or positive you feel, right? So high energy negative might be like full of rage, right? But low energy positive might be like chill, mellow, feeling good, right? So there's a graph where you can literally track the way that you feel and then here's the key. In the app, once you log your mood for that time of day, they give you an opportunity to ask yourself and to answer the question, what were you doing immediately before this? And what that helps us to do is to recognize what factors in our lives are making us feel a certain way. This was actually a real big surprise to me when I started this work because I was having relationships with people in my life that I really wanted to keep, that I assumed were adding a lot of value to my life because either I put them on a pedestal or I thought they were really cool or they were doing things that made me think that you know, they were cooler than I was and I should work hard to keep that relationship in my life. But when I looked at Mood Meter, I noticed that I actually felt worse about myself after I hung out with them. And the things in my life that I wasn't adding a whole lot of value to, things like, you know, the classes that I went to or, you know, some of the friend groups that I socialized with, things that I was doing at that time because I just felt like I should have a social life, you know, they actually were things that were enriching my life and elevating my mood and making me feel good afterwards in ways that I was actually surprised about. So something like Mood Meter, whether you choose to use the app itself, and again, I like the interface because I find that having that X, Y axis of emotion makes things super clear, but you can absolutely do this in a mood tracking journal or in any way that works for you. But doing that, doing that practice, whether it's Mood Meter or whether it's simply mood journaling, will bring a lot more mindfulness, a lot more awareness to the things that you're doing in your life and the results that they are creating in you emotionally. What are we doing hoping that we will be happy because of it and actually seeing the results shows that we're not that happy about it, right? What are the things that we actually don't like doing, have resistance to doing, but once we do them, we feel so much better, right? Things like maybe straightening up our house or things like going to the gym when we'd rather hit snooze, right? We get out of the gym after having had a workout and we are like, wow, thank God that I didn't hit snooze this time because now I feel amazing. I feel ready to take on the day. The more we can look through that, the more aware we'll become of the choices that we're making in our daily lives and how they're affecting our state of being and whether they're actually helping us to be happier and more effective or just the opposite. And finally, another way that we can discern for the patterns that we tend to enact over and over in our lives is we can ask the people in our lives for feedback. Here's an exercise that I absolutely recommend for self-awareness. I would pick 20 people, if you can, who know you from all different aspects of your life. So that means former colleagues, maybe, that you've worked at with other jobs, 
ex-boyfriends, ex-girlfriends, ex-non-binary partners, friends in your life who are close to you, people who maybe know you from different organizations that you volunteer with, your D&D night, whatever, ask them if they would be willing to share with you their impression of you and put those impressions into two categories. One category, what are some things that you could perhaps be doing better or improve upon? What are some things that they see you doing that they think aren't quite coming across in exactly the way that you intend, right? Like for example, if you notice that you're sliding into a lot of people's Instagram DMs, if you're friends with someone like me, they might point that out to you. <laughs> and then the other category, you want to ask for what your gifts are. What are the things that you're really good at? What are the things that you naturally do in flow without even maybe giving yourself credit for it, right? The reason I like this balance is one, first of all, I think balance and polarity is necessary in pretty much all aspects in our lives. And I don't want us to get too far into the scale of beating ourselves up, but I also don't want us to get too far into the scale of maybe inflating our egos over all the reasons that we're great without acknowledging some of the places that we might be operating unconsciously as well, right? But asking for both of these categories gives a nice balance. And what we do then is, we are not interested necessarily in any one person's specific opinion of us because there may always be outliers. There will always be people who see us and perceive us in ways that are not necessarily accurate. There will always be people out there with their own projections. However, if we ask 20 people and we scan all of those responses and we start to see patterns creep up, and we start to see the same things being mentioned over and over, then we can be pretty sure that those are some of the patterns that we engage in. And from there, we can both acknowledge the patterns that are working for us and the things that we are doing without thinking about it that are actually helping us versus the patterns that are negative and are not really the things that we wanna do. So So now that we have achieved some recognition of the patterns that are operating in our lives, well, what do we do in order to change them? First of all, we want to ask ourselves, is this working? And sometimes just the question, is this working? If we come back and we have an answer that's a no, is enough to motivate us to bring more mindfulness to our behavior and to try something different. And as we're trying things that are different, we can then make note again of whether those things are working. And honestly, this is like the best way to live our lives. It is a growth mindset, it is a, it is a feedback based mindset, it is a learning mindset, right? This is exactly the things that we are wired to do neurodevelopmentally as we're growing up that we're not conscious of and that we then get stuck in these patterns and no longer do with the conscious awareness of adults when we are adults. So being in our adulthood and getting to do that now, I believe in taking back our power and calling back all of our discernment so that we can actually ask ourselves, are these things that I learned to do, are these strategies that I learned to take on to get these results, are they actually getting me the result or not? And sometimes just asking that question is enough to make us change our behavior, to motivate us to change our behavior. Another thing that we can do is we can look at the four different ways that our beliefs are formed and we can backwards engineer them, right? One of the ways our beliefs or our patterns are formed are, is by a traumatic incident, something that is so big that it changes our beliefs on the spot. Now, it's hard to say backwards engineer trauma, right? That's not necessarily something that we wanna create in our lives. But what is the opposite of trauma? Something that happens that is so negative that it changes our beliefs around it. Can we perhaps orchestrate an event that is so positive that it changes our negative beliefs? So I'll give you an example. Perhaps when you were a kid, you were in art class and your teacher held up your drawing and made fun of it. And from then on, you're like, no, no way. I never want to draw again. Well, maybe as an adult, you decide, you know what? I'm done with that. I'm going to prove that belief wrong with something that is even bigger. And I'm going to submit my art to be displayed in a gallery and I'm going to invite my most supportive friends who absolutely want to see me succeed and I'm going to orchestrate this event where I can actually be celebrated and honored for the gifts that I have in the artistic realm. And this event is going to be so transformative to me 
that it's going to overwrite <laughs> the negative experience that I had from my art teacher when I was much younger. Now that can feel scary, right? Because if we have the belief that we're going to be made fun of in the first place, it can be hard to overcome that. But we're capable of it and we can do it with a little bit of bravery and a little bit of heart. We can absolutely get there. What's another way to do this? We can join a social circle. We can join a new peer group full of people who believe those beliefs, right? We become the average of the five people that we spend the most time with. I'm sure you've heard that phrase before and it's true. So if I want to change something in myself and the way that I'm doing things, I make a conscious effort to make friendships with people who are also doing those things in the world, right? <laughs> and that way I osmose, right? I, I use my biological imperative for inclusion, my biological instinct to belong. I use that in my favor to make sure I'm belonging to a group that is going to have the effects on me and my behavior that I want it to have by choosing the people I surround myself with deliberately. Next, Repetition. Repeating our language over and over will start to program our brains. This is essentially the foundation of the soft science that is known as neuro-linguistic programming, something that I'm certified in and that I practice and I love using intentional language. Now I understand if you don't necessarily feel a certain way about your life yet, it might be hard to stand in the mirror and do affirmations like, you know, if you feel like crap about yourself and you will be like, I'm beautiful, I'm abundant, I'm a money magnet, I'm successful and I'm all powerful and whatever. And it's hard to believe, right? And science actually shows that if you're trying to force it, it can actually have a negative impact because you know you don't believe it and your brain therefore dismisses the whole thing as being BS. So the way that you can combat this instead is you can create a statement of intention that you know and feel to be true, that gives you hope toward your path, right? So I might wake up one morning and I might feel, ugh, I feel terrible in my body or my life doesn't feel great right now, but I might look in the mirror and I might say, hey, things might not feel great right now, but I am resilient, I'm courageous, I'm brave, I'm powerful, I'm capable, and I know that I have all the tools and resources that I need in order to make the changes in my life that are going to get me the results that I want in the long run. And just waking up every day and committing to that one step at a time is going to help me get there. And just starting with a statement of intention like that is going to take you on that place where you'll be on that trajectory where things will get better and better and better. I cannot overstate the importance of intentional language and the way that we speak to ourselves. That could be a video unto its own, but since this is already pretty long, I'm just going to keep going down the list. <laughs> and finally, we can, um, let's see, what did I do? Social circle, joining a peer group, repetition, trauma, and oh, hypnosis is the final one, right? So I work in a modality called timeline therapy, which is a branch of hypnosis. and. Working with a facilitator to change your unconscious beliefs is another way that you can start to install those new patterns, right? I'll let you look into that on your own time. Just know that it's available to you if you choose to go that route. To wrap it up, we have these patterns that get set very early on in our lives and we keep on doing them thinking that they're going to work even when there is mounting evidence piling up in our lives that shows that not only is it not necessarily working, it might even be causing more trouble than it's worth. How do we break those patterns and form and install the new ones that are going to work better, right? And it's just about recognizing those patterns in our lives, recognizing, and importantly, recognizing you know, the positive ones as well as the negative ones, because just as important as getting rid of the things that are not working for us is highlighting and appreciating and appreciating ourselves for the things that we're doing that are working for us. And then we take those negative patterns that we no longer want to be running in our lives and we use the strategies that I've talked about today in order to turn around that ship in the ocean and make those changes sustainably, step by step, by doing the things like joining new social groups where we can make friends with people who are also doing those things and living in those ways that we want to be living, choosing the way that we talk to ourselves, acting with self-care, self-forgiveness, and setting up opportunities for us to prove our fears wrong by taking those brave and courageous leaps of courage. So hopefully 
having watched this video and having learned a little bit more about this, you now have a bit of a better understanding of how to recognize your patterns and how to start creating those changes in your life. It's been an honor and a pleasure to appear today on Harris's channel and thank you for tuning in. And if you wanna learn a little bit more about me and about the work that I do, again, my name is Arden Lee and I am the creator of The Repatterning Project. You can find out about that at therepatterningproject.com but it's actually easier to just find me on Facebook and I'm friends with Harris there too. So go ahead and look me up, send me a message, let me know that you watched this video and say hi and I'd love to be connected with you. Good luck out there and happy repatterning. And that's gonna do it for this week. Thank you so much to Arden for coming on and being part of this episode. I really appreciate it. Everybody should go check her out. You can follow her on Twitter and Instagram at It's Me Arden Lee. You can learn more about The Repatterning Project at facebook.com slash The Repatterning Project or TheRepatterningProject.com. Links are in the show notes, so go check those out. Meanwhile, you can follow me on Twitter at, at @drnerdlove. Join the private Facebook group, Nerd Love Academy, at facebook.com slash groups slash drnerdlove. And as always, hit that logo to subscribe, check out my other videos, and I will see you here next time with more about love, sex, and dating. Thanks for watching.